Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. I'm thrilled to be back hosting this wonderful podcast because of all of you, my wonderful listeners. I did want to let you know that I have updated my Patreon fan club levels So if you're interested in more content or if you're interested in just ad free content, go check out the Patreon fan club today. I added a $1 a month club. Yup. For just $1 a month, you can get completely ad free shows. It's outrageous. Sometime today, go check it out. Patreon.com slash military murder to see how you can join the fan club. All right. On to some content. Some of y'all have been hollering about my recent episodes, the top 10 murders and the Fort Hood review because y'all come here every week to hear in-depth coverage of one single case a week. And today I am back to that format. Today's case appears to have caused a lot of waves, but sadly, even though it's recent 2016, I had never heard of this case until I stumbled upon it while researching a different case. Join me today as I discuss the Japanese case dubbed the Suitcase Murder on the island of Okinawa, Japan. Now, let's dig in. My sources for today's case include articles by Stars and Stripes, Daily Mail, Washington Post, The Japan Times, The New York Times, Ryokyu Chimpo, and a scholarly article found in the Asian Pacific Law and Policy Journal by Brandon Mark If you do a Google search of Okinawa, Japan, you will see images of a beautiful island with turquoise green water, snorkeling, sandy beaches. It's a dream. The images breed feelings of peacefulness and joy. Okinawa Island is home to many military bases. Before researching this episode, I could name two bases, Kadena Air Base and Camp Foster. But I soon discovered there were many more military installations on the island including Camp Kinzer, Camp Hansen, Camp Shield, Camp Courtney, Marine Corps Air Station Fute, Fort Buckner, Camp Lester, and I'm sure I missed a ton. In fact, according to the Washington Post, there are 33 U.S. military facilities in Japan. What? And guess what? 85% of the bases are on the island of Okinawa. That is a freaking lot. And that's a lot of Americans on a small Japanese island. Well, I'm not sure what number of Americans are on Okinawa. Just know that there's like 47,000 troops stationed there. And remember, they bring their families with them. So it could be double or triple that number of Americans roaming that small island in Japan. Apparently, for many years now, tensions have been high due to how many American troops are on the island. Well, and let's not forget World War II. But more or so, the tensions are high because the Japanese people feel that the Americans commit way too many crimes on their streets and the American service members are protected from Japanese prosecution due to the status of forces agreement between the U.S. and the Japanese government. According to the Japan Times, from 1972 to 2015, there were 26 murders, 129 rapes, 394 burglaries, and 25 arsons, all committed at the hands of U.S. troops. So it's understandable why tensions are high. And this next case that I will cover would make tensions even worse. On April 28, 2016, in Yoruma City, a 20-year-old Japanese woman sent her boyfriend a text message to let him know she was going for a walk. The woman's name was Rina Shima Bukuro. Her boyfriend found it odd that she never texted again that night. She didn't say, hey, hon, I made it back. She didn't say anything. So the next morning on April 29th, when Rina's boyfriend failed to hear from the 20-year-old, he called the police and reported her as missing. 
and this would begin the almost month-long search for Rena. Japanese authorities scoured the area where Rena was known to go on walks, and finding no physical evidence, they turned to CCTV footage of the area where she could have last been seen. During the time she went on her walk, they saw approximately 300 cars on the footage. One car in particular stood out because it was seen on other CCTV footage in the area. Surveillance footage caught a man buying salt at a convenience store and sprinkling it in his car, a red SUV. When Japanese authorities saw this, they believed the person could have been doing this in an attempt to get rid of blood. The Japanese authorities decided to contact a sampling of people who owned cars that were seen on CCTV footage around that area. And one of those persons was a 32-year-old civilian contractor that worked at Kadena Air Base. His name was Kenneth Franklin Gadsen. But after he married a Japanese woman, he decided to take her last name. So his official name was now Kenneth Franklin Shinzato. Investigators took weeks to find all those people seen on CCTV footage, but three weeks after Rena went missing, they caught up with the guy in the red SUV, Kenneth. When Kenneth was initially interviewed, he was calm, he didn't seem panicky, he didn't seem to know anything, and he claimed he didn't know Rena. But it wasn't until his phone was searched and they found a picture of Rena on his phone and confronted him with it that he realized the jig was up. Without too much pushing, Kenneth spilled the beans and he told Japanese investigators he could lead them to Rena. Investigators found her. She was dead in a suitcase. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. 
And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash Military Murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. So who is Frank Gadsden Shinzato? He's a 32-year-old civilian contractor who was working at Kadena Air Base as an IT services contractor. Kenneth told investigators that he had heard voices in his head since he was eight years old. He grew up in foster care until he found his forever home. And Kenneth claimed that his foster mom abused him. And due to this abuse, Kenneth dreamt about killing his mother. The mother, however, denies any abuse. Well, Kenneth's feelings towards his mother then appeared to have developed because then he began to fantasize about kidnapping and raping women against their will. And this crazy idea snuck into his head when he was just a teen in high school and followed him into adulthood. In 2007, Kenneth waltzed into a Marine Corps recruiting station. And when asked during a group interview, why do you want to join the Marines, young man? Kenneth claimed that he told recruiters, because I want to kill people. Well, the recruiter apparently didn't find that alarming and said, another body to carry a gun and Kenneth joined the Marines. (laughs) I'm just kidding. That's not actually what happened. Um, He did actually tell them that he wanted to kill people. And regardless of what they thought, according to Kenneth, he was actually disqualified from the Marines because of a nut allergy. But according to him, he fabricated a doctor's letter and it was accepted and he got to join the Marine Corps. Kenneth became a Marine and he worked as a postal clerk. Once Kenneth joined up, his fantasies about killing, though, they turned inwards somewhat. Before, he used to daydream about killing other people. But now, as a service member, he sort of fantasized about different ways to kill himself. For example, according to the Daily Mail, when he was out doing long-range swim training, He would actually fantasize about drowning after he tired himself out from swimming long lengths. Another time that he would think about it was while he was out on the shooting range, he'd fantasize about hiding in the bushes, turning the guns on his comrades as they shot him back. You know, in my time as a true crime enthusiast, I had never, I don't think, read about someone who started out with ideas of killing others and then turn those ideas inwards towards oneself. In any event, while stationed in Japan, Kenneth met and married a Japanese woman, and he ended up taking the woman's last name, so that's why he was known as Kenneth Shinzato. In 2014, Kenneth left the Marine Corps, but stayed in Japan as he was married to a local national. A few months before Rina's murder, Kenneth and his wife welcomed their first child into the world. When reporters caught up with Kenneth's mother, 63-year-old Shirley Gadsden, she was told about the murder charges against her son, and she was in disbelief. Kenneth had stopped talking to his mother after he left the Marines, so she was shocked to hear the news in general. As soon as the news broke that an American connected to the military base had been arrested for a local national's disappearance and murder, Kadena Air Base went into crisis management. They put out a statement sending condolences to the victim's family, but also adding, quote, we also send our deepest sympathies to the people of Japan and express our gratitude for the trust that they place in our bilateral alliance and in the people of the United States, end quote. And this statement is crucial, right? Because the U.S. president at the time of this murder was President Barack Obama, and he was scheduled to visit Japan in the summer of 2016 for a summit and also had a scheduled visit to Hiroshima to remember the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, during Kenneth's interrogation, Kenneth revealed the disturbing events of the night that Rena went missing. Kenneth was interrogated on May 19th, and that's when he brought authorities to Rena's body. While he had been held since May 19th, formal charges came three weeks later. Apparently, that's a thing in Japan that you can be detained without immediately being charged. On June 9, 2016, Kenneth was indicted at the Naha District Court for abandonment of a body. A few weeks later, on June 30th, 
he was indicted for homicide and rape resulting in murder. Two days after that, on July 2nd, Kenneth released a written statement to the media. In it, he argued that he was physically and mentally at his weakest point after his two suicide attempts. And that's when the police came a-knocking. Kenneth had allegedly attempted suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills on May 17th and May 18th, of course, being unsuccessful on both accounts. Kenneth was brought in for questioning on May 19th, and that's when he made his full confession. And at trial, he'd later claimed that he was dazed and confused from his suicide attempts. But like I said, he made a full confession. And let's not forget that he took authorities to Rena's body. During the initial interview, he said that he was driving around looking for someone to kidnap and rape. He drove around for two to three hours looking for the perfect victim. He had fantasized about it for so long. And April 28th was the day. He was filled with excitement as he thought about the pleasure he'd take in acting out his sick fantasy. Various women passed Kenneth in his car as he waited for his prey. When Rena walked by his car, he looked at her and he knew she was the one. Not only because he's a weirdo, but because he said that he heard a voice tell him, quote, it's her. That's the one that will fulfill your fantasy, end quote. But then he told himself, nah, 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 nah. Initially, he wasn't 100% sure she was the one until he looked up into the sky and he saw a red full moon And that's when he knew that was his sign that she was the one. They were kind of in a secluded area with trees off the path and he approached her from behind. He said that he hit Rena with a stick over the head. His intent was to render her unconscious. But a homeboy Kenneth came prepared. He knew it would look super weird to drag an unconscious person through the grass or through anywhere really because who the hell does that? So he brought a suitcase with him and it was in his car ready to transport his victim. He was going to knock out the woman kind of in the woods or whatever, then go back to his car, get the suitcase, stick her in the suitcase and roll her out of there like nothing. He claimed though, he never intended to kill. He was going to take his unconscious victim to a hotel Reminder, in a suitcase, he was going to take her up to the room, have his way with her, and then release her. Apparently, Kenneth was aware that sex crimes often go unreported in Japan due to the stigma. So he thought he'd never get caught. He thought the victim would never reveal the rape. But we know that crimes don't often occur as smoothly as the criminal hopes. After he struck Rena, he began to drag her when a car approached, shining their headlights at them. This spooked Kenneth, so he dragged Rena back a little bit further into the woods, claiming that she must have hit her head when he was trying to hide. But Rena was no longer unconscious when he got back there. And as she began to talk, likely in a panic, like, is this a nightmare? Kenneth began to strangle her. He claimed he did it out of panic, not with intent to kill her. He then left her there while he went to his car to get a suitcase. Because remember, according to him, his plan wouldn't work without the suitcase. According to Kenneth, he put Rena in the suitcase, put the suitcase in his car, and then he drove to Ana Village's Afuso district. And this is where he decided to abandon his plan to rape the woman. In fact, she was no longer of use to him since she was dead. But when he dumped her body, he wasn't quite sure she was dead. He thought she might have said something like he it was like, she talking to me or what's going on? So while according to him, he never intended to kill Rena, he said he then stabbed Rena multiple times to see if she was alive. Ugh, clearly, this man is not the brightest crayon in the box. When she didn't make a sound, he was sure she was dead. Then Kenneth made a startling realization that as he was driving away from where he had just dumped Rena, quote, I was thinking that the effort required to play out my fantasy was more than I expected and the fatigue and stress was not worth it, end quote. This guy, 
Oh, this guy drives me crazy. Before leaving Rena behind, he took her keys and her cell phone. He took a picture of her phone and then while driving home, he dumped the items in a body of water. Initially, he was a bit paranoid, sure that the police were going to show up, sirens blazing to arrest him. But after a day went by and then two and three and four, he said he just kind of forgot all about Rena. Isn't that the craziest thing ever? A real sign of a psychopath? I feel like you often hear about people not being able to live with the guilt, but for someone to actually forget that they killed someone and abandoned them in a suitcase, I would love to learn more about the psychology of his train of thought. So the above story was what Kenneth told authorities. But what the Japanese authorities discovered was that what Kenneth said happened and what the evidence revealed highlighted two different stories. While Kenneth said he only hit Rena over the head before putting her in the suitcase and shoving her in his car, it appeared as though he stabbed her in the neck with a knife so that she would stop resisting. Then he placed her in the suitcase and took her to the place where he later abandoned her. Kenneth was ultimately charged by the Japanese authorities. He attempted to get a venue change as he thought a trial in Okinawa would never be fair. Remember all the shade the Japanese locals were feeling towards the wild Americans on the island. Well, the judge was like, too bad, so sad, denied. Which meant that Kenneth would be tried by the Japanese lay judge system. According to the Japan Times, That entails being judged by three legal professionals and six lay judges, which ends up really being like a regular jury here in the U.S. Except that in Japan, they actually get three judges and then they get six people from the community. And the trial would be an interesting one since Kenneth made various statements, including an initial statement. And then he made a jailhouse statement, which was memorialized in four separate statements stated September 2016 through January 2017, statements that were later provided to the news source Stars and Stripes. However, those transcripts have never been revealed in their entirety. Kenneth's defense attorney told Stars and Stripes, quote, Kenneth is competent enough to feel that he has not been treated fairly in the way the incident has been reported. But he's incompetent to recognize the seriousness of his conduct. He has no sense of guilt for the victim. To him, it was her fault for having been there at the time, end quote. The crazy part is that because Rena had laid dead in the elements for a few weeks, her body was so badly decomposed that a cause of death could not be determined. She could have been strangled to death or died from stab wounds or died from a head injury, but it would never be determined. Rena was only identified using dental records. In late 2017, the case was finally brought forward and the case would be widely publicized, making for a transparent case in the Japanese criminal justice system. Kenneth originally claimed he didn't rape Rena, and he almost always maintained that his intent was to rape and not kill. Therefore, he believed he shouldn't have been charged with premeditated murder. As for physical evidence, DNA evidence matching Rena's was found in Kenneth's car. At trial, Kenneth pled guilty to rape, resulting in death and abandoning the body, but he pled not guilty for premeditated murder. At court, he said, quote, I did not mean to kill her, end quote. So I find all of this discussion about what he's pleading guilty to or whatever interesting or fascinating because in the U.S., he would have probably just confessed to a felony murder which is when a murder occurs during the commission of some other offense, some other felony, I mean. And his state of mind as to the murder would be moot for felony murder because he claims, he says, he had the intent to rape, which is a felony, and the girl happened to die during the attempt to rape her, and that's felony murder. The idea that the female would die may have never crossed his mind. But remember, it doesn't matter. A person died because of your actions in committing another felony. In any event, Kenneth was convicted of murder and rape, although I'm not sure what evidence, if any, there was of a rape and whether 
Kenneth was telling the truth about not raping her or what. Kenneth did face the death penalty, and that's, of course, what the victim's family argued was fair and just. The prosecution also argued for death, claiming that it was a worthy case because the defendant lacked remorse and never once apologized for his actions. Kenneth ultimately was sentenced, though, to life in prison. He appealed his sentence, claiming there was no intent, therefore the conviction was wrongful. But the appellate judge disagreed and upheld the conviction and the sentence. So, Kenneth is currently sitting in a Japanese civilian jail doing his life sentence. While Kenneth committed his heinous murder in 2016, this case came with the backdrop of a brutal rape that occurred in 1995, 20 years earlier, that continued to haunt the local nationals. According to the New York Times back in 1995, three military men stationed at Camp Hansen kidnapped a sixth grade Japanese local and beat and gang raped the 12 year old in the back of their car rental. And then they tossed her out like trash. They had originally gone out with the intent to share a prostitute, but when one of them didn't have enough money to cover his share, they decided that, you know, well, rape is free, so why not give it a gander? When the men returned to the military base after the rape and the U.S. refused to hand the men over for Japanese prosecution, tensions in the country rose. But they would eventually be turned over to Japanese authorities and they were tried under Japanese law. The service members were sailor Marcus Gill, Marine Kendrick Ledit, and Marine Rodrigo Harp. Marcus pled guilty to rape and the other two pled guilty to conspiracy. The two Marines maintained though that they never raped the girl. They were all sentenced to between six and a half years and seven years in Japanese prison. They were all released in the early 2000s and received under other than honorable conditions, service characterizations from their respective military branches. And that last tidbit I received from Wikipedia. The crazy part is that Kendrick led it, who had argued he never raped the girl. Well, that guy in 2006, he sexually assaulted a college student, then strangled her and bludgeoned her to death. Then he killed himself. So talk about a life of crime. Stay tuned until after the credits today where I will discuss what I found about Ledit's murder-suicide. Well, a few months before Kenneth killed Rena, a different sailor allegedly sexually assaulted a tourist while at a hotel. And by the time that Kenneth committed his heinous crime, leadership, at least in the Navy, had had enough. Eric Slavin with Stars and Stripes reported that the Navy officials barred sailors in Japan from, get this, non-essential off-base activities and banned drinking alcohol. What? Can you imagine? That sounds crazy. Well, Navy leadership, they were not messing around. Stars and Stripes, no kidding, posted pictures of empty alcohol shelves at the NEX slash the shop at that look so sad. According to the Daily Beast, the entire U.S. military in Japan imposed a midnight curfew and prohibited alcohol consumption outside the base, at least for 30 days, starting on May 28th as a, quote, self-proclaimed period of mourning, end quote. And wait for it. It appears that the fun was canceled all the way through the 4th of July weekend because there was a ban on fireworks. The entire 4th of July bash was canceled and it had originally included live entertainment, including a live performance by Usher. And of course, no one was allowed to drink alcohol. You see, what a lot of people don't understand is that all of these crimes detract from the military mission. Leadership are the ones who have to deal with the blowback from crimes committed by service members. And after this particular ban, Navy leadership, at least, they were fed up with all the naughty sailors taking away from the mission at hand. After Rena's murder, thousands of Okinawans protested having U.S. forces in Japan. 65,000 people, to be exact, protested, and many of them wore black armbands to symbolize the Okinawan Solidarity Movement. They held signs that said, no rape, no murder.
To find more information about the case, make sure that you check out my resources in my show notes. And if you like the show today, be sure to share it with a friend, share it on social media. And when you do so, don't forget to tag me so that I can repost it on my account. All right, you can find me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. And you can join the Facebook discussion group at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. I want to give a shout out to the newest dotted line Patreon supporters of the show, Andrea W., Rachel V., and Jordan W. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. This week's newest assistant producer is Texas Grandma. The music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Thanks for sticking around. And for those of you who wanted to hear more about Kendrick, here we are. So Kendrick Ledit was one of three military members who during Labor Day weekend in 1995 decided they wanted to go buy some tail in Okinawa. But when one of them failed to have sufficient funds, they decided that kidnapping and rape would have to suffice. They went to the store, purchased condoms and tape like duct tape and went on a hunt. They ended up kidnapping a 12-year-old girl from the streets. They duct taped her eyes shut and they tied her hands together with the duct tape and then proceeded to beat the young girl. Then they raped her. Once they were caught, it took some haggling, but eventually the Japanese authorities were allowed to prosecute the military members. At trial, one of the men claimed all three of them raped the girl, but two of the men, including Kendrick, said while they helped in the kidnapping and beating, They did not go through with the rape. They said they were scared of the ringleader. They eventually all pled guilty. The alleged ringleader pled guilty to rape. The other two pled guilty to conspiracy. They were sentenced to roughly six and a half years. After serving only five years, Kendrick was released from Japanese prison, where he was returned to the U.S. Kendrick's sister told the Associated Press that Kendrick returned to his home in Georgia, where he really wanted to put everything that happened in Japan behind him. He wanted to start a new, fresh life. And it seemed to be working. He worked various jobs, including serving at restaurants, because he wanted to buy himself a BMW. That was his goal. And guess what? He did it. But something happened. In 2006, he was working at the Zuka Bar and Pizzeria in Smyrna, Georgia. He had a 22-year-old co-worker named Lauren Cooper, who was a college student at Kennesaw State University. Well, apparently on August 18th, Kendrick and Lauren were at a party together when they left the party to go back to Lauren's apartment. She lived on the third floor of the villas of Kennesaw Complex. After Lauren's parents hadn't heard from her for a few days, which was not very common because she was always in communication with them, they decided to pay the college student a visit. And when they arrived, the door was locked. But Lauren's dad, he felt in his heart, in his soul, that something was wrong. So he kicked the door in and walked into a scene a parent should never have to see. Inside the apartment, his daughter was dead and nearby lay the body of a man. That man was Kendrick Ledet. The scene was investigated and Lauren's autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and bludgeoned with a hard object. Kendrick, it appeared, had committed suicide with a knife by slitting the arteries in his arm. He died from loss of blood. An eerie message was discovered on Lauren's phone after she was murdered. It was a message to an unknown friend that said, quote, I'm stuck with him, end quote. According to an article in the Pensacola News Journal, Lauren may have been referring to the fact that Kendrick didn't have a car, which is suspect since his sister told AP News that he worked hard to buy a BMW. But maybe it's just that Kendrick didn't have the car that particular night. In any event, it's possible that Lauren was just trying to be nice by inviting Kendrick over, and he may have thought something more was going to happen. And when she rebuffed him, he snapped. I mean, this is all possible. And also, I have not found anything that has said that Lauren and Kendrick had a romantic relationship at all. 
Lauren's parents were devastated at Lauren's death, of course, and they wanted more answers. They felt that they were not getting enough from the police department. So they hired their own investigator, although I do not know what their investigation revealed. Another shocked person, though, was Kendrick's sister, who doesn't know what went wrong. She says that she had seen her brother on the up and up since he returned to the U.S. from Japan, what, like five years earlier. So she doesn't know why Kendrick snapped. That's it, y'all. That's all I wanted to bring to you. I just wanted to bring a little bit of conclusion to that story about the 1995. I don't know where those other two guys are, but I did want to just leave you with that. <laughs> 